Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Hannah Shaw is not available. At the tone, please record your message. Hi, my name is Sarah, and I'm calling about my cat, Pluto. I know dental care is really important, but when I try and brush her teeth, she gets really reactive. I know that there are dental treats that can clean her teeth, so I guess my question is, if I'm giving Pluto dental treats, is brushing her teeth really that important? You're listening to Not Just Fluff, pet wellness from Banfield Pet Hospital, hosted by me, Hannah Shaw, animal advocate, otherwise known as the kitten lady. If you're like me, you love your animals a lot, but they can't talk and it can be tough to know what they really need. Not Just Fluff is here to provide you with actionable tips and science-backed advice from reputable professionals who really understand pet care. I work with a lot of cats and kittens, and dental health is always something that's top of mind. But let's be honest, cats are not exactly known for being very cooperative when it comes to brushing their teeth. So I really empathize with your question, Sarah. To speak about this more in depth, today we are going to talk with Dr. Kate Hilsentager at Banfield Pet Hospital, who is passionate about animal dental care. Kate is an area chief of staff for Banfield, She has a BA in history from Rice University and received her DVM from Texas A&M. After graduating from vet school, she moved to the Portland area to complete an equine surgery internship, then briefly worked as an equine ambulatory vet before moving over to small animals. Welcome to the show, Kate. Thanks for having me. So before we get started, I would love to just hear if you have any animals at home. It's kind of a funny story. We have one German Shepherd, but he's my husband's police canine partner. So he's a working dog. Oh, interesting. How long have you worked with animals and what inspired you to pursue a career as a veterinarian? I started working with animals when I was in fifth grade. I started horseback riding lessons, which meant that by the time I was like 12 and 14, I was teaching riding. Well, no, I guess by 14, I was working for the barn where I where I took lessons. And then over time that took over and like taking care of the herd and feeding them and spending pretty much every day there. Eventually I realized I'd always been working with animals and I don't sit at a desk very well. So I was like, that's cool. That's a good choice. I love that you've been involved in animal welfare for as long as you have. I I totally relate to that. And I don't sit well at a desk either, to be honest. So it's an awesome career that you have. You know, on Not Just Fluff, we love hearing tales from the vet. So this episode being all about dental health, I wonder if you can share a story about maybe an animal that you've treated and how proper dental care made a difference for them. I saw a five-year-old little bitty chihuahua, and he was coming in for an oral surgery recheck, and I didn't perform his surgery. Instead, he'd seen one of my colleagues at the hospital two weeks prior, and he'd come in. He was this darling little, little cute thing, and he had all of his little incisors in the front on his bottom jaw removed because they had gotten pretty infected and wiggly, and it healed up beautifully. And when I went in to talk with his owner... The, the conversation was, well, he's gained weight and he's super energetic and he's so happy. And it was just one of those stories where I was like, I can't tell you for sure that it was the oral pain of those missing, those loose teeth making him not want to eat very well. But all the signs are pointing that way and he's been kind of quietly suffering with it. And so she was really happy with his attitude. I was really happy with how well he healed. And then we spent a good like five minutes talking about how to start brushing his teeth. It was a fun adventure. That is so awesome to think that, you know, the decision to take care of something like an animal's dental health can have these like cascading effects down to even their ability to get proper nutrition. I am really happy for that chihuahua. I would love to dive more into this subject with you. I want to start by asking about a very common sign of dental disease, which is stinky breath. So I think a lot of animal lovers just sort of accept that stinky breath is like a normal part of taking care of an animal. But is that true or should we be concerned if a cat or dog has foul smelling breath? I think it's good to be concerned since especially that if that smell has that 
odor of infection, that is definitely not healthy. And so I have fun conversations when I start talking about oral health, starting to brush your puppy and kitten's teeth regularly. And then this, the idea of a preventive dentistry starting at one to two years of age. I get a lot of crazy looks. Like I'll mention it 20 times a day that we should be brushing teeth and I get laughed at probably 17 out of 20. You know, if a cat or dog has that kind of like foul smelling, like you said, maybe sign of infection breath, what are some of the things that people should be thinking? Like if they are, if I'm snuggling with my cat in bed and her breath stinks, what are some of the things that that could be telling me? Sorry, you said cat. So that kind of changes my answer a little bit. With a dog, I'd first be like, is there a stick stuck in there? Because that happens. Kitty cats don't do that as often. So it's not as common first thought. But I do think also, is there an area in the mouth that has an abscess where we have infection under the gum line and we're not seeing it, but it's starting to get pretty, pretty bad and likely painful? Or in some cases, would that be a sign of another systemic disease? There are some things that can make your breath smell bad, but Overall, I go straight to, is there periodontal disease in there? And do we need to get in there under anesthesia and assess it? And is there a stick in their mouth? Can you talk more about that? That was not what I was expecting. I mean, dogs and cats will get into crazy things. And so I've had several times where a dog has like gotten a stick, like stuck in the roof of their mouth. And then they're just running around like crazy. And it starts to stay because it stays in there for a while. And they're really quiet about it often. But when we open the mouth and look in, they're like, oh, there's a stick or something else stuck in there. And we can sedate the pet and remove it and feel like a hero, which is always fun. Yeah. You know, I often think about how much I wish I could just ask my animals what is going on. And it's frustrating that they can't tell us like, hey, I have a stick stuck in my mouth or something hurts. You know, cats and dogs can be pretty masterful at hiding signs of of pain. Can you talk a bit about dental pain, something that if you've been through dental pain, you know you would never want your cat or dog to experience. How do cats and dogs show that they're in dental pain or what might be a sign of that? They are notoriously difficult to pinpoint that it is dental pain. Like I've had pets come in for acute, like day one of not eating. And on my exam table once, I had a dog spit a molar out on the table and he'd only stopped eating that day. There was a lot of other stuff going on in that mouth, a lot of oral surgery needs, but that one tooth was really bothering that day and it was loose enough that he spat it out. And so I would say it's subtle often that they're having oral pain. Like they might notice that there's a change in how they're chewing or they might be dropping food. Most of the time they just tolerate it, which is sad. And so when I do find things for a, a patient who's here for a routine dental and I find something abnormal, I do like to preface like, it's not an emergency. Your pet's been hiding this for some time. Now let's make a plan. So trying to give people just, because there's that, as pet owners, we want to do what's best for them. And it's a lot of stress, especially when suddenly you're like, hey, incidental finding today, we have an abscess tooth. Sure. And I think what you're saying really illustrates how much Sometimes we might not visually or even like by smell be able to tell what's going on until it has progressed quite a bit, which is why I'm always telling people you knew do you do need to take your cat or dog in for, you know, these preventive appointments so that you are actually getting eyes from a veterinarian on your animal. They can they can see things that maybe you are not able to notice yourself. So can we talk a bit about preventive care? I wanna know. Are there things that people can do at home to prevent dental disease? I love preventive care. I feel like preventive care is amazing. And every time I can prevent something, hallelujah. So brushing every day would be the ultimate prevention. At the same time, it won't remove the need for oral annual dental cleanings. And so I like to tell people, we brush twice a day. We floss. We use mouthwash. We chew gum. And we still go to the dentist twice a year, ideally, to get our teeth cleaned by a professional hygienist. Whereas our pets, by and large, never brush their teeth. And I might get the opportunity to do a first dental cleaning at four years of age for some pets. And that's after they've had those permanent teeth for three and a half years without brushing. So the more we can do at home, the better. So brushing, dental chews, dental rinses. I have so many questions for you about this because... Obviously, you know, 
humans, we brush our teeth every day. It's very simple. It's very normal part of human wellness. But probably when you say this to people about their cats or dogs, they probably look at you sideways like, wait a minute, do I really have to brush my cat or dog's teeth every single day? Um, how how do you talk to people about the importance of this, you know, when they're like every single day? Is it is it different for cat people and dog people when you have this conversation? Because I would guess as a person who has cats that it might be. Talk to me about like how you frame this for people. It is a challenging ask because you're asking them to build this into their daily lives and to train their pet to accept it. Because it's not like you're going to get them to sit there with their mouth open and just let you scrub away for two minutes every day. Um, and so it's like when they're, ba- when they're kittens and puppies getting in there and brush like one tooth, call it a win, give them some treats. Then brush two teeth the next day, call it a win, give them some treats. And like generally acclimating them just slowly to the process and then ideally building it into your day. And I will just flat out, I, like, I have a nine-year-old daughter and I still find that getting my human child to brush her teeth twice a day is a challenge. So I accept that this is a big ask. Sure. So it sounds like it's all about kind of getting them into a bit of a routine with it. Can you kind of walk me through step by step? Because I want to I want to envision how this works for you step by step with your cat or dog, and maybe it's different uh, for each. What position are you getting them into? Like, how long are you brushing their teeth? Give me the play by play. I think it's funny that you're on team cat, and I probably am thinking about dogs. So I should like ground myself on this. I'm on both. I'm on team cat and dog. I foster both. So I just have cats. So I definitely think of it as a picking a time of day that you can commit to trying this. And I tend to have people start with like a little finger brush that's going to be like just not as intrusive and less risk of like bonking them in the back of the mouth or anything. And I have people focus on what I call the lip side of the teeth. So the part of the teeth that touches the lips and the cheeks most of the pathology I find is on the lip side. And so I have people start by trying to brush the lip side of the teeth. It's pretty rare that I go in to do a dental cleaning and check the tongue side of the teeth and find something, but it's possible. And so my big ask is brush the lip side once a day and like really starting slow. So you're starting with that finger brush and just trying to get like, get in there and like get the pet to accept brushing just a little bit of the teeth and positive encouragement, positive rewards. And then you're slowly... Maybe it takes a month to get to a place where you can comfortably have that pet sit there and let the brush for a one to two minutes and get all that food residue off so we don't have tartar formation. I have a friend, a coworker, she had Sonicare toothbrush heads for each of her chihuahuas. And I was like, you have now exceeded all of my expectations ever. (laughs) Wow. I love that commitment. You know what? Our our animals are are very important like members of our household, so why not? Talk to me a little bit about the products that you're using when you're brushing cats and dogs' teeth. I assume you're not talking about, you know, grabbing our own toothbrushes and toothpaste cuz human toothpaste can be harmful for them. We actually at most of my hospitals we hand out a we give people a packet that's from the veterinary oral health Commission VOHC. I want to make sure I'm giving you the right acronym, but that is veterinary and approved products that are safe for use in cats and dogs' mouths. And so we do want to make sure we steer people to the right products that are going to be safe. So I don't say like, please don't go home and use your toothbrush on your dog. That could be bad. But like maybe somebody doesn't want to buy the whole oral health kit from their vet right away. So I'll be like, can you get like an old toothbrush from your dentist that you, or a toothbrush from your dentist you've never used, label it with your pet's name and start there. I'll even have people start by putting peanut butter on it once they've gotten past the initial like two weeks of training this dog to accept it or their cat to accept it. They go and buy cat or dog friendly toothpaste. And what flavors are we talking here? I think the flavors have gotten really good lately, like bacon, chicken, peanut butter, cheese. So The lesson here is keep your toothpaste and your cat or dog's toothpaste in a different place. Otherwise, you might end up reaching for bacon-flavored toothpaste, which would be ah, not fun when you're brushing your own teeth. (laughs) I have never thought of that. Great call out. (laughs) Yeah, you know, I'm a spearmint girl myself with my toothpaste. And I think if I reached for toothpaste and got tuna instead, it would not be the best day of my life. (laughs) 
That would be awful. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So the important takeaway there is different products for different, you know, different species and different strokes for different folks. I'm not going to knock bacon toothpaste for a dog if that's what's going to get their teeth clean. I want to talk about dental treats and toys. There's a lot of dental treats and toys on the market. Um, My cats actually have these dental sticks that have like silver vine in them, and they love them. They like tumble around and, you know, chew on them and kick them. But I wonder sometimes, is this actually helping their teeth or is it just like a fun toy? So how effective are dental treats and toys? I have a hard time keeping up with all the new wonderful products out there. I think this thing that has been stuck in my head for a while is that, well, every little bit you can do helps is what I also like to stress. But I like to tell people like they will help and every little bit helps. Brushing is still best and an annual dental cleaning is still recommended. Mm-hmm. Okay. So everything you can do helps, but it, a treat or a toy does not take the place of brushing or professional cleanings. Let's talk about professional cleanings. Is this something that every animal needs or is this something that only certain animals need? Can you talk about like who needs these cleanings and and why? This is something that I spend way too much of my time on. <laughs> I mean, because <laughs> it's such it. a big part of my my career. And if I could ever figure out a way to do a professional cleaning for a cat or a dog without needing anesthesia, it would be miraculous. But current state, it's not possible. Dogs, for instance, have 42 teeth in their mouth. And it's very hard to get in clean and assess 42 teeth unless the pet, unless the dog is asleep. And so what I haven't found really interesting in my career is that it started when I was a vet assistant eons ago. We only clean teeth when a problem happened. And over the last 15, 20 years, we really are trying to move to preventive dentistry where we get away from the idea that we have to wait till there's an issue before we clean those teeth. And so getting in at one year of age for a little dog can make a huge difference to assess like, are there problems brewing here? Are we already starting to get tartar? Can we put a sealant on these teeth to try to keep them healthier longer? Whereas I have clients who'll come in at four or five, six years of age, there's tartar across all their teeth, the gum line's irritated, and I have a hard time convincing them a dental is needed. I'm like, well, if we go another year or two, you're going to lose some teeth. You know, it's so fascinating what you said about the changes in approach, because I think that so much uh, applies with, you know, within animal health, within veterinary medicine, there's so much that we can do to prevent disease rather than wait until it, until it appears. One consideration that I think a lot of people have, one concern that I think a lot of people have with regard to dental cleanings is the cost, just because, you know, they can feel cost prohibitive for some people. But with with so much of preventive care, my perspective is it's actually more cost effective to prevent than to wait until everything kind of goes wrong. Can you talk a little bit about the cost of preventing dental disease versus maybe what the cost of having dental disease could be? Certainly. Like, I like to think of preventive dentistry as those routine cleanings that we do under anesthesia. Ideally, we now couple it with full mouth x-rays to see what's going on underneath the gum line. And then we're polishing and charting the mouth and making sure everything's moving in the right direction. Like if we have young teeth, they're all present and accounted for. There are none missing under the gum line that could cause problems down the road. Um, and then we're keeping that pet on a healthy dental schedule going forward. That, I mean, we could spend a couple hundred year, hundred dollars a year doing that, or I use the wellness plans because they make it more affordable. Whereas I'll have other times when I do a first dental on a client, on a patient, and I call their owner and I'm like, okay, so we have multiple teeth that are loose. We have areas in the mouth that are painful. I suggest we do a couple things today and then you can consider seeing a veterinary dentist a specialist who can tackle this all in one go where you're going to be doing multiple rounds of oral surgery with me, which can cost you like $800, $1,500 each round, which in theory, all of that was fairly preventable. 
Sure. Yeah. So it, you know, having animals in our lives is an expense, but there's kind of the way of approaching it uh, with a preventive mindset. And then there's the way of approaching it, waiting for everything to go haywire. And in my experience, that can be quite a bit more costly. Now, I know that part of the cost has to do with anesthesia, which is another concern that a lot of people share. You know, I want my cat or dog to have good dental health, but do I really need to put them through anesthesia for these cleanings? So can you talk a little bit about what people can expect with anesthesia at a dental cleaning and maybe some words of comfort for people who are concerned? We have a lot of anesthesia safety standards because we don't take anesthesia lightly. And it is something that requires extensive training for the veterinarian, for the technicians, for the vet assistants. And so every pet that comes in for a routine cleaning with me or any doctor at Banfield or any veterinarian anywhere um, will have protocols for what is permissible, like what can, what's acceptable to find on a physical exam? What are red flags that would make me stop and reconsider? We do blood work. Um, We have what we call stops and critical stops on all of their lab results that day. Um, We evaluate trends in their medical history and we decide, is this pet safe for anesthesia? And then once we have them under anesthesia, we have rigorous standards for pre-op checklists for safety and drop monitoring and post-op recovery. Um, And so I would say like the idea of safety standards around it is incredibly important for the veterinary industry. Um, And I think that's where I feel like Banfield's done a lot to really raise the bar on what is safe and what are the best practices. Um, And so, yeah, anesthesia, I don't do it lightly, but we have current state, I cannot find another way to get this done. Sure. And, you know, I think it can be a comfort for people to hear a bit about this because as just, um, you know, somebody who is bringing their animal to the vet, if you're not in the veterinary profession, you might not realize how rigorous those safety um, procedures are. I always encourage people to just ask a lot of questions and be really curious. Um, You know, don't be afraid to have conversations with your veterinarian about your concerns because you might find that, um, you know, things are, you might find that you can take a lot of comfort in what you learn from your veterinarian. Can we can we talk a little bit about what happens if you ignore all of your advice? We ignore everything. We don't do anything for our cat or dog's teeth. Um, from what I understand, dental disease can affect animals in so many ways, some of which people might not expect. Um, so what can happen if a cat or dog's teeth are not cared for at all? If a cat or dog doesn't have any dental care, I do expect some evidence of oral pain in their future because they are going to experience tooth decay, periodontal disease. Kitties can have this really crazy thing called a resorptive lesion where their body just attacks their, it's kind of like like a cavity on steroids. It can degrade the entire tooth so that the crown just falls off. So tooth loss, either from a broken tooth or infected teeth. Um, But then the pieces that are harder to track would be Infection in the mouth can then lead to bacteria in the bloodstream, which can cause issues with the kidneys or the liver or the heart. Those pieces, like there's a lot of evidence around it, but it is hard to say that that's like if somebody, if a pet came in with terrible periodontal disease, I wouldn't say, well, that's the cause of their heart failure, but I would say it's a problem. And I have, um, for instance, diabetic pets that need to live on insulin and we have a really hard time regulating their their blood sugar, if they have periodontal disease, it will interfere with our ability to keep that pet stable. Um, And so teeth are very important for keeping our overall health on track. Yeah. Wow. I mean, this has really been a very enlightening conversation. And I want to go back to the original question that kicked off the episode. Do you have any words of comfort for people who have an animal that is resistant to this care, um, they're resistant to brushing, uh, or is there anything that you would say to them to really encourage them to start taking dental, dental preventive care seriously? I think for anybody who is concerned and feeling challenged, just trying to look at it from in that multimodal avenue. Like how can we use, what are the pieces that your pet will tolerate? Is it 
for instance, your pet is never going to let you brush, but we could use water additives. We can do dental treats. We could do a dental diet. We can plan for those annual dental cleanings. Um, and so feeling like, yes, brushing is best and it's not accessible for everyone. So like, what is the plan and strategy that's going to work for your pet? And how do we get that going? Mm-hmm. As a foster parent, you know, I think it's really our responsibility to prepare our pets for a good life ahead, including having, you know, good experience at the veterinarian. So I always tell foster parents, handle your kittens and puppies' paws so that when it's time for their claws to be trimmed, they're comfortable with that. I think now I'm kind of realizing you should also probably get them used to having uh, their mouths touched and, and their teeth handled. Is that right? a great call out. And so I do love to put that on the list now of things to do exactly like you're saying for foster parents, all of that for new puppy and kitten owners and and for like adoptions of older animals, like gradually getting them used to it um, and not expecting it to all happen in one day because it's going to be a gradual process. Banfield's here to provide you and your pet with smart, affordable, high quality pet care so you can worry less about the vet and wellness stuff and instead enjoy life with your BFF. That's why we created Optimum Wellness Plans. Our plans aren't insurance. They're year-long bundles of preventive care custom-built for the pet you love. Plans include unlimited in-office visits, 24-7 chat for general pet health advice, virtual vet visits, vaccines, dental cleanings, discounts, and more. Optimum Wellness Plans. Essential pet care made easy. Learn more by clicking the link in the show notes or visit us at banfield.com. So what I'd like to do now is share some fast facts with one another. And these are going to be just, I don't know, interesting tidbits that we both know about teeth. Obviously, I work with neonatal animals, so uh, my fast facts are all going to be about kitten and puppy teeth. Uh, My first thing that I want to share is one that it actually surprises a lot of my adopters. So kittens and puppies, much like baby humans, uh, have deciduous teeth, which are, you know, they're baby teeth. So I think a lot of adopters are surprised to learn that, yes, even though you adopted that, you know, 10-week-old puppy or kitten and they had a bunch of teeth in their mouth, those are not their permanent teeth. You're going to find that as their adult teeth start to erupt, those teeth are maybe going to, you might find a tooth on your pillow, like the tooth fairy is going to come visit. So um, that's my first fact. Uh, anything that you want to add to that for listeners? Ooh, I my fun fact would be that not all puppies and kittens will lose their teeth naturally. And so if they have what we call retained deciduous teeth, that can become a problem later in life and we'll recommend extracting them after a certain age. Um, And so it might be cute when they have little shark teeth and look like they have rows. (laughs) But if it stays that way long-term, we're going to have a lot of crowded teeth and problems. Yeah. You know, I see sometimes it's interesting because they'll have two canine teeth sometimes. So like the little fang tooth. Um, they'll have two of them maybe on each side. And like you say, it's it's interesting. Um, but, you know, at what point would you recommend that people go, okay, this might be an issue? Between six to 12 months, if they're still there, that's typically a sign that they're not going to fall out on their own. So I'll often offer it to remove them when they're having their spay or neuter procedure or around a year of age at their first dental for sure. small and medium dogs. Great. So my my second fast fact is also, you guessed it, about baby teeth. Um, I'm very, very passionate about talking about baby teeth. And so my fact is about baby tooth development and how actually it can be a very good way to tell what age a kitten is. So sometimes people try to tell what age a newborn kitten is based on their weight or what they visually or based on their visual appearance. Um, But I actually tell people, open up their mouth because that is going to be a more accurate indicator of their age. You know, kittens can be a greater weight or a lesser weight depending on their wellness or, you know, their 
the type of kitten they are. Um, but teeth are a pretty accurate predictor of their age. So um, those first deciduous incisors come in around three weeks of age. Around four weeks, we start to see their canine teeth. And then around five weeks is when they get the premolars, the like pointy teeth on the side of the mouth. Do you have another fast fact you'd like to share? The one I like to bring to people's attention is that missing teeth can be a problem. And so if we look in the mouth and we're missing premolars or incisors, the question is, where is that tooth? Um, Because it could be that that pet was born without the tooth, maybe, maybe, never formed, or it could be stuck under the gum line, in which case it could cause complications. Like it can even cause what's called a dentigerous cyst, where it starts creating a cyst and then invading the surrounding bone, which can cause problems. Or in like our kitty cat patients, it means at one point maybe they fractured off the crown um, because they have resorptive lesions. And so missing teeth are a great reason for me to advocate for oral, like full mouth x-rays to see what's going on. That is really interesting. So it sounds like opening your cat or dog's mouth and taking a peek at what's going on in there is an important thing for all of us to be doing. Dr. Kate Hilsentager, thanks so much for sharing your knowledge with us, and thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me. So do we really need to brush our pet's teeth? Short answer, yes. I think an important takeaway here is that dental health is essential to the overall well-being of our animal companions, and that it's never too late to start on their oral health journey. I know this conversation has made me think a lot more about steps I can take with my cats at home, as well as things I can do to help my foster puppies and foster kittens acclimate to having their teeth touched so that they can have a great shot at dental wellness in the future. So Sarah, to answer your question, dental treats are great, but they're only one piece of the puzzle. When it comes to more reactive animals like Pluto, we want to go slow. So get her used to gradually touching her teeth and don't be afraid to reach for a toothbrush and some of that yummy bacon flavored toothpaste. Overall, while preventive care at home is awesome, it does not replace the need for professional oral care. So an annual professional dental cleaning is still recommended for your furry friends. Thank you for listening to Not Just Fluff pet wellness from the pros at Banfield Pet Hospital. Make sure to get your paws on the like and subscribe buttons so you don't miss an episode.